If you're thinking about getting into astronomy as a hobby, you'll be faced with a choice very early on. Do you go down the visual road looking through an eyepiece at faint distant objects? Or do you go down the astrophotography route where you're possibly using a DSLR or mirrorless camera or even a dedicated tech called astro camera? Those two choices are both expensive no matter which way you go. I'd say the most common road that people take is they go down the visual astronomy route first and then after a while try to attach a camera to a setup like this and start imaging with it where they quickly discover that there are some limitations trying to use an old azimuth mount like this for long exposure photography. I'm making a rice pudding. I love rice pudding. I did things the other way around. I started by heavily investing into astrophotography. In today's episode, I'm going to share with you what it's like to do visual astronomy coming from an astro imaging background. I've had to set the bar quite low so that at the first moment at the eyepiece, I wasn't disappointed. I'm gonna rank the targets that I hit last night in order of most impressive to least impressive and hopefully share some insights with you along the way. Stay tuned until the end of the episode and I'll share two images with you that I was capturing at the same time with my wide field imaging rig while being down in the courtyard looking at those targets through this telescope here with friends and family. I come from a very small oh, village. Wait. A... I just realized I don't care. Santa. Scepter. What I'll do now is I'll show you my perceived size. Mm. Let's just crack on. So apparent size in the eyepiece, Jupiter at 25 mil was probably about that size there. So the second target I visited was the Pleiades or Pleiades, depending on where you're from, the Seven Sisters with that beautiful blue nebulosity there. And I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know whether I was actually going to see some nebulosity. I didn't, <laughs> is the honest truth. But what I did see were the seven very vibrant, bluish, whitish Seven Sisters. So that color there that appears here in Stellarium did actually translate through the eyepiece for the stars themselves, and they were just brilliant. So third, we visited NGC 869, a big, vibrant double star cluster. So the view with this 25 millimeter eyepiece was pushed in slightly from the middle ring there, but was able to see both clusters at the same time through the 60 degree field of view of this 25 millimeter eyepiece. And it was just spectacular, just seeing so many stars tightly packed in and nice, sharp, again, contrasty views of those stars uh, when in focus was really good. Now above Vega, there's double double one and double double two. Well, it looks like two stars, but it's actually four. And it's a good test of your optics, your eyepieces, and your optical tube, the seeing on the night, to be able to see if you can split those double stars. Now, I popped on this 10 millimeter Celestron Luminos eyepiece to see whether we were able to do it, and we were able to just get there on double double two. So having looked at a few star clusters, some double doubles, it was time to actually move on to a galaxy. And of course, which galaxy was I going to look at first? Our final destination in a few billion years, Andromeda Galaxy, which is absolutely massive. I'd set some really low expectations with what I thought I would see through the eyepiece. Had the 25 millimeter eyepiece, which had me at about 60 times magnification, and boom, slewed the mount across to it using Stellarium. There it was, very visible. It was just a large, fuzzy, elongated patch, basically like a cloud. I visited it a few times through the night as the telescope got to cool down, as the scene got to improve because the turbulent air had moved away. So later in the night, I was actually able to make that elongation of that fuzzy cloud out better. So a technique I was playing with uh, to basically get better views of this fuzzy large patch, which I knew is very bright when I'm imaging it, but obviously quite faint in the eyepiece just because of the aperture of the telescope was that I had to use something called averted gaze where I'm looking around into the black space around the fuzzy patch, the patch with the cone cells in the center of your retina, which aren't very sensitive to. If you think in positive terms, you will achieve Now to enjoy Andromeda Galaxy through the eyepiece, I was having to employ a 
technique called averted gaze, which is where rather than staring directly at this elongated fuzzy patch. What do you want that you do not have? At the moment, peace and quiet. So after a couple of hours of bouncing between the targets I've spoken about, the Great Orion Nebula M42 had risen to about 18 degrees and I was able to actually look at it. And it was at that same time that I ran upstairs and turned my imaging rig at 383 mils in narrowband to 03 and started imaging Orion Nebula for the rest of the night. So I got about three and a half hours of data and I'll show you that image at the end of this video. Orion Nebula for me was the highlight of the night. As the night progressed, those views just kept improving and improving. The telescope was finally becoming acclimated after a few hours and cooled down to ambient. So the elements were working better. The seeing was improving as that storm had moved through and the air became more settled and Orion was rising further and further into the night sky. So I was gradually looking through less atmosphere to see it. Now it is let me tell you, absolutely spectacular to perceive that nebulosity. There are so many nebula that are just too faint to be appreciated or even seen for that matter at F10. Orion Nebula is well known in imaging circles for being quite a difficult target because it's got such a massive dynamic range. So the trick there when you're imaging it is that you take extremely short sub-exposures Relatively speaking, we're talking 10 to 15 second sub exposures to focus the core and get the detail in the core without blowing it out. And then taking three to five minute exposures of the surrounding nebulosity and blending those two and masking them in post to bring out the best of both. A really nice detailed core that's not blown out and really good detail in the surrounding nebulosity. The benefit of being so bright is it's one of the very few nebulae that actually reveals its nebulosity through the eyepiece of the telescope. And as the night progressed, I was able to perceive that more and more and see the shape there, the relief, that dark patch in the middle was readily apparent at 25 mils through the eyepiece, as well as 10 mil 150 magnification with the Luminos eyepiece. By this stage, everyone had gone home and I was at the eyepiece by myself in the darkness trying not to trip over my cables and I moved the telescope over to Bode's Galaxy. Fantastic, it was, it was a big fuzzy patch and actually really rewarding to think about the fact that this thing is, distance is 11 million light years away. I was really rewarded with a fantastic big fuzzy patch there. So after Bode's galaxy, I slewed the telescope over to the Triangulum galaxy. And again, it didn't look anything like you see here in Stellarium, but it looked quite similar, in fact, to Bode's galaxy in terms of being a fuzzy patch there that you were definitely perceiving. So after Triangulum, purely out of curiosity, I slewed the telescope over to IC1396, the well-known Elephant Trunk Nebula, which is a favorite stomping ground for images both new and old to the hobby. I'd spent quite a few uh, nights imaging IC1396 and you can see the image I produced here of it with my own wide field narrowband rig. And I had zero expectations for seeing anything and zero was exactly what I got. Uh, it's far too faint to actually perceive any nebulosity in real time at F10 aperture. It just wasn't happening. All I saw was a few stars and I knew that moving on to the next target, NGC 7000, the North American Nebula, Cygnus Wall Pelican Nebula, I was not going to be seeing anything there either and that's again exactly what happened. So in imaging these targets, these massive nebulae that span multiple moon spans across the night sky are extremely rewarding. Through the eyepiece, nothing there to be seen at F10 anyway. At the same time, my wide field imaging rig had been spending about three and a half hours imaging M42, the Great Orion Nebula, in O3. It was basically zero moon last night, so perfect for capturing the Oxygen 3 signal from Orion Nebula. I also got my core shots in 
hydrogen alpha, 15 or so shots at about 10 second sub exposures that I'll then use to blend into where you see that the core is overexposed at the moment to bring detail out. But tonight it's gonna be clear again, so I'm gonna actually continue imaging M42 tonight, but I just wanted to show you what that actually looked like when I stacked three and a half hours of oxygen three data on M42, whilst at the same time being down in the courtyard appreciating it being purely in awe of it really through the eyepiece and just being gobsmacked at how much nebulosity was coming through there from that bright core. But let me zoom in on PixInsight and show you some of the beautiful detail in this nebulous cloud around M42 in Oxygen 3. Ignore the blown out core. When you're imaging M42, it needs to be done in stages. Very short exposures for the core and then longer exposures for the nebulosity. What you're looking at here are the longer three minute sub exposures stacked to show that beautiful, almost fairy floss texture of that nebulosity out around M42 in Oxygen 3. It looks like a funnel web spider's home. Honestly, it's just got, this texture and three dimensionality to it that is mind blowing. And I wanted to fly into it and make a bed in there. It's just like, <laughs> it was freaking amazing. Um, but I'm super excited to continue imaging Orion Nebula. Last night was the first time I've ever slewed my wide field rig onto it. Bearing in mind, that's extremely low at the moment. It's down around 18, 20 degrees, so only just above the horizon. I'm shooting through about two atmospheres to get to it, but still remarkable views there. And just really thankful that it is such a bright core because what that means is that you do get fantastic views of it through the eyepiece. If the core was dim and fantastic for imaging, meaning I could capture the whole target in the same sub exposure length, it would be nowhere near as good to enjoy visually. So yeah, it's that trade off, isn't it? But yeah, this is the thing, being able to now do the hobby on both sides of the fence, visually and imaging, you start to appreciate those pros and cons because they play off against one another. And so here we have the image that I was able to compile last night in Oxygen 3 of M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, the one that we're on a collision course with. It's coming for us, we're not going for it, by the way. And the thing about it, you know, hobbies are supposed to be fun, right? And playing by the rules isn't always fun. And that's what this is. This is not playing by the rules because Andromeda, being a galaxy, lends itself to being imaged in red, green, blue, or LRGB, luminance channel, red, green, blue, so that you're perceiving the real colors there. Effectively, what I'm working on here is a narrow band composition, a fake palette image of Andromeda. So I'm capturing in hydrogen alpha, sulfur two, and oxygen three, to then combine those and create an artificial palette. So in a future episode, I'm going to pull together this edit of Andromeda Galaxy and compare it to data that I've gotten from the Telescope Live website, a remote imaging subscription service, to see what we can get with our own home rig versus setups that are possibly worth tens, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds. So stay tuned for that one. Guys, hit that bell, get involved with the channel, get down in the comments and type what you'd like to see. I'm really enjoying making this content Content. Now being able to uh, appreciate these things with a camera and with my own eye is just simply fantastic. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one. What if I tell you there's a hobby out there that will test your patience like no other and get it transferred into the body of the camera? That will satisfy your tinkering needs. That will drain your bank account. That will mean you don't need to come into contact with anyone ever. Welcome to the world of mono astrophotography. This is Astro with Chris.